afternoon. I'm Mary Schmidt Campbell, and as the 10th president of Spelman College, I'm so pleased to welcome you once again to one of our dynamic conversations that is part of the Black in the C-Suite Courageous Conversations sessions. Co Courageous Conversations has been our way at Spelman College to hear from Black women leaders who are willing to enter into candid conversations with us about their journey to leadership roles in corporate America. This afternoon, our guest is the legendary Ursula Burns. Before I introduce uh, Ms. Burns, we'd like to hear a word from our sponsor. And just as a reminder, we'd not be able to present and promote these sessions in the way that we do without the generosity of our sponsors. And one of our leading sponsors is Coca-Cola. Here to represent Coca-Cola is the president of the Coca-Cola Foundation, Sadia Madsberg. Sadia Madsberg joined Coca-Cola last June as vice president of global community affairs and president of the Coca-Cola Foundation. The foundation focuses on enhancing the environment, community well-being, and women's empowerment. Prior to Coca-Cola, she was managing director of Rockefeller Foundation and worked for New York City Economic Development Corporation, Cisco Systems, and at McKinsey and Company. Her work has been featured in publications such as Harvard Business Review and Foreign Affairs. She is the co-author of the book, Making Money Moral. I love that title, Sadia. Sadia, thanks so much for being with us and now over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, and thank you for that warm introduction and the kind words about the company and the work that we do. Um, it is absolute pleasure to be here today. And I would like to start by commending Dr. Campbell and the entire Spelman College family for bringing this thought-provoking and engaging conversation series to all of us. Um, it brings together not just the community, but some of the most inspiring and highest ranking corporate members of society to have a conversation about things that sometimes can be difficult to talk about, but absolutely show us the way forward. Um, so thank you for your leadership in that regard, and thank you for setting an example for all of us, and, and particularly for women of color. Um, I do bring greetings from the CEO and chairman of the Coca-Cola company, James Quincy as well, and the entire company, particularly the Spelman graduates that we have working here. Um, since the earliest beginnings, um, our company has had a special connection with many of the different institutions in our community and many of the educational institutions as well. And Spelman has always had a special role in that um, community and in many of the partnerships that we've had, and particularly as a company. Dr. Campbell, you were talking about women's empowerment being a particular focus to us. I mean, that's something that's been core to the work that we do. And that is something that we share in terms of the focus that Spellman has as well. So we here at Coca-Cola Company are passionate about building sustainable communities, creating access to education and empowering women. And we have attempted to do that through many different ways. One of the big initiatives that we had put in place a decade ago was focused on empowering 5 million women across the globe by the year 2020. Um, we were able to exceed that goal by a million women. And one of the big tools that we used in doing that was really education and skill building. So a lot of what, you know, the work that you do and, and we were able to build on that. Um, I guess, you know, at the end, I would say that our mission here at the Coca-Cola Company is to refresh the world, um, to inspire moments of optimism, um, to create value, and to make a difference. And I cannot think of a better way to inspire um, you know, a conversation than what we're going to have here today. So thank you so much for letting me be part of the conversation and letting the entire Coca-Cola company be part of the conversation. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Ms. Madsberg and the Coca-Cola company. 
as Black young women burgeoning into our own realms of expertise and striving to excel in all that we do, it is of the utmost importance for Spelman College students to see and hear firsthand the journeys of trailblazing Black women who have cracked the glass ceiling and are committed to bringing other women of color along with them. The Courageous Conversations Black and the C-Suite series offers the Spelman community a behind the scenes view of the strides Black women have taken to reach amazing heights while allowing their personal compasses to guide their decision-making. Thank you again, Coca-Cola and UPS for sponsoring today's conversation and the many ways that you support Spelman College. My name is Nyla Barnes. I'm a graduating senior, double majoring in international studies and French with concentrations in cultural and curatorial studies from Deerfield, Massachusetts. I have the distinct honor and pleasure of welcoming you to today's Courageous Conversation, an opportunity to engage and learn from Black women excelling in the C-suite. Our featured guest is Ms. Ursula M. Burns. Ursula Burns regularly appears on Fortune's and Forbes list of the world's most powerful women. Many know her as the first Black woman CEO of a Fortune 500 company. During today's conversation, we will hear that she has done so much more. Ms. Burns, congratulations on your accomplishments thus far. We thank you and we celebrate you for the immense impact you have had and continue to have within the STEM field and beyond. I would also like to express my deepest gratitude to you for candidly sharing information about the true toll of being the first in your industry and your ever expanding self care practices that include dispelling the narrative of being a superwoman or invincible and the way that the media often portrays high achieving black women. I feel honored and privileged to have the opportunity to introduce today's conversation between President Dr. Mary Schmidt Campbell and the incredible Ursula Burns. I know my Spelman siblings share my excitement to hear what you have in store for us today. Thank you so much, Nyla, for that wonderful introduction. I have to say, Ny Nyla Barnes has been an absolutely dynamic student from the time she set foot on Spelman's campus. Uh, she's done so many things. It would take me all afternoon to document all of them. But she mentioned that she has a passion for the arts. And she's right now serving in the very prestigious position of curatorial fellow at the High Museum of Art. And Nyla has taken on the task of working with the National Historic Trust to do research, archival research on our Rockefeller Fine Arts Building as we take on the task of doing all the renovations for that building. She, has a, she is a Wrangell Scholar and has great plans for after graduation. She plans to apply for a Fulbright Scholar, travel to Dakar, Senegal, and she aspires to do her graduate work at Oxford in the field of visual material and museum anthropology. We wish you all the best, Nyla. Now, I know that when we have these conversations, there are lots of questions that come up, so feel free to enter all your questions in the chat. Um, I have someone who will be feeding the questions to me as, as uh, Ursula Burns and I are in conversation and will take the questions as we go along. Today, I have the great pleasure of conversing with a living legend, Ursula Burns. She's the founding partner of Integrum Holdings, a venture capital firm, chairman of Teneo Holdings, and of course, the retired chairman and CEO of Xerox Corporation and Beyond Limited. She is, as Nyla said, the first Black woman to be named the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. As Nyla shared, Ursula is also one of the, has always been identified as one of the world's most powerful women. From being selected to, to lead the White House National Program on STEM from 2009 to 2016, to leading large multinational companies at the helm of the ever-changing tech in industry, she is really a multifaceted trailblazer. In terms of her education, Ursula holds a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Columbia University and a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Polytechnic Institute of New York University. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Royal Academy of Engineering and the G7 Gender Equity Advisory Council. She is firmly committed to making STEM fields more inclusive. 
Ursula is also a member of uh, a number of public companies, the boards of a number of public companies, including Exxon Mobil, Uber Technologies Inc., Endeavor Group Holdings, and IHS Holdings Board of Directors. She's a founding, as I mentioned, a founding partner of Integrum Holdings, and she is also the exec executive chairman of Plum Acquisition Corporation. In addition, she is on several private company boards, including Waystar, here.com, while also providing leadership counsel to several other community educational and nonprofit organizations, including the Ford Foundation, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cornell Tech Board of Overseers, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Mayo Clinic, among others. Ursula Burns, we are super excited that you're here for us with Spellman, for Spellman's Courageous Conversations. And uh, as we always do with our guests, we ask you to tell us a little bit about how you grew up. Where, where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? So Dr. Campbell and Spellman sisters, uh, thank you for having me. It's uh, exciting. I have a niece, actually a cousin, I call her my niece, who is a Spellman sister and all, so I, <laughs> I'm kind of engrossed in your life through her. Her name is Crystal Wadler. Um, so my growing up, I um, am the child of a single mother, an immigrant from Panama. Um, I have a brother who is two years older and a sister who's two years younger, middle child, typical middle child. Um, my mother immigrated when she was 25 years old and I was not yet, none of the kids were born with my father from Panama to New York City. And I would say we were a typical black poor family living in an urban environment, in, in the biggest urban environment in New York City. Uh, so very bad housing, extremely bad food, very, very, very poor, um, financially very poor. We didn't have anything from a, from a financial perspective and we had even less from like healthcare and clothing and food and comforts, but we had an unbelievable mother who was just amazing and focused on her assets. The only assets that she had were her three, her three children. So she focused all of her energy, all of her effort on protecting, protecting nurturing and growing these assets. And I was extremely close to my mother. She died when I was 25 and she was 49. And I was the child who was kind of like under her foot all the time. You know, my brother kind of went and did his thing after a while, my sister went and did her thing, but I was, I was always with my mom and I had probably the most impact from her and all of her habits and her sayings and everything, everything about her. So I, I grew up in Lower East Side of Manhattan, poor, fatherless. My father left when I was very, very young. I met him for the first time consciously when I was 16 and my brother was 18. So we didn't have any, I had no idea of who he was or where he was. My mother didn't really spend a lot of time on that with us. It was, it was not something that she dwelled on. And actually she didn't, more than not dwelled on, she just never spoke about. Um, I went, my mother was focused on education. Uh, she happened to be a Christian, a Catholic, but, but we went to Catholic school primarily because it was the safest place to go to school. Otherwise we would have had to go to the public schools in the neighborhood and that was just uh, an untenable situation for my mother. It was dangerous, it was drug infested, it was very poorly uh, done from an educational infrastructure perspective. By the way, it's still very much the case in a lot of urban environments, as, as you know. And um, so I went to Catholic school from the time I was in kindergarten, first grade, until I graduated from high school. Um, and my brother and sister went to Catholic school in grade school, but both of them could not stand the discipline and just the amazing structure that the, that the nuns had. In some ways, very cruel. I mean, today's, in today's environment, you would never be able to do what the nuns did to us when we were growing up. I was okay there. I actually am pretty, I'm a conforming kind of person in that environment and was able to just kind of fit in and fly a little bit below the radar screen. So I went to 
grade school, grades one through eight at Most Holy Redeemer High, uh, grade school. And then I went to high school at Cathedral High School. It was one of the most important decisions in my life. I happened to go to a great all girl Catholic high school that was, I mean, when I say great, it was a Catholic school. So we didn't have a lot of science. We didn't have a lot of math. We had the basics. We learned how to study. We learned how to write. We learned how to speak. We learned how to learn. It was really important thing that I learned later in life, how little uh, people are learning that, how to learn, how to be intellectually curious, how to kind of have what I call grit, you know, this idea of kind of grinding through it. And um, I was a great student there. It was all girl and it was very helpful to not have the distractions and just whatever happens when you have other, you know, when you have the other gender in school with you. And I was good at math, but not good enough to be great at math. You know what I mean? I, in my school, I was really good at math, but comparatively, I was below, well below average. And I took the PSATs and um, happened to score well in math, uh, well below the norm of what a good score would be. I was like below 600, believe it or not. Um, but that was stellar in my environment. And I was told by one of our guidance counselors who was a visiting guidance counselor. Most of my teachers were nuns. So we had very, <laughs> very little guidance about the outside world and what you do there. So a guidance counselor would come in once a month to the school. And I was talking to her and she said, you're good at math, you should do something with it. And you should look at these kinds of fields. My, my teachers by that time had told me I had three choices in education, what to do after my education. I could be a nun, I could be a nurse, or I could be a teacher. That's serious, that, that was the advice that we got from, this, from, the, from the Catholic school structure. And this guidance counselor said, yeah, those, those are reasonable choices, I guess, but um, there's more you can do. And I got hooked into engineering and, and just by happenstance, I uh, chose um, engineering because I went to the library, looked at a book called the Barron's Book, which they still have, I guess, but it's not a book anymore, now it's online. Mm -hmm. And the, the book was, the, the question I had was, what's the field that you can study that earned the most money after four years of college? That was literally the question. And that field was was uh, chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. And so I said, that's it. I'm going to become a chemical engineer. I remember this when I was a senior in college. I had no idea what the hell a chemical engineer did. Um, I had I hated chemistry. I mean, I took one chemistry class. I thought it was the most bizarre and boring subject to hold. <laughs> but I said, you know, my mother needed help. You know, she we were, for her whole life, she struggled. So I figured, you know, I had to go to college. My mother didn't give us a lot of choices there we had no money to pay for college but fortunately we were so poor we qualified for everything we qualified for free applications i qualified for this kind of scholarship this kind of work study for all kinds of things to kind of build things together to afford an education so i applied to all of these schools got into a large number of them you know yale um poly columbia all of these schools and you get into them and um, I got into them under a program called HEOP, which is the Higher Education Opportunity oh. Program. And it's a state-run program, and it's all about finding students who have potential but didn't have the background or the funding or the older correct classes. They pay for you to go to college, give you a stipend, and you have to, you get tutored in all of these subjects to kind of move along. And that's how I got to college. Literally, I was not qualified for the open admissions of any of the colleges that I that I um, applied for, but I had the potential to to get there, and so and the rest, as they say, is history. I went to work at Xerox over the summers, and I stayed there for what is it, thirty eight years um, at Xerox Corporation. I have a brother who's older, as I said, and he's a, a lawyer, and a sister who's younger, who now is a social worker, but she also had, she had a whole complicated life before she became a social worker. <laughs> Um, and I have two children. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, two children. So, so I, 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 I'm struck by this, the word you use. Your, your mother had these assets. You were, your, her children were her assets. And this is where she was investing her time and her energy in these, these assets. I love that asset-based image 
mm -hmm. um, that you present to us. Now, now, you went to Polytechnic, which is in New York City, and uh, graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering, right? Correct. So, so um, and then went on to Columbia. Um, it, it's often been said that engineering is a great degree to have for all kinds of fields. You know, people say if you want to be a lawyer, you should study, you know, engineering and, you know, all that. What is it that you, in studying engineering, that gave you insights into, that you would use later on in life? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's one, I literally got passionate about STEM while I was studying to be an engineer. It wasn't called STEM there, then it was whatever the heck it was, science and math. I got passionate about it because basically what you learn as a, an engineer is how things, what's possible physically, mm. what's possible um, biologically, what's possible. And you find out that th there's so much possible, but we haven't yet found a way to do it, right? There's some things that are laws of nature, but there are very few of them. If you think about it, E is equal to MC squared, right? We got that. F is equal to MA. There's like, there are probably 10 things that define the world that we live in and everything between that, everything, between that, those 10 things are discoverable. And engineering teaches you about process, about organized thinking and problem solving. It teaches you about getting something done and then perfecting it, right? So you get it to work once and perfecting it. So it teaches you about process again. It teaches you about what's possible in the world. It teaches you that, um, that working together as a team, that there are very few things that you can do alone. So it's, there are, in addition to teaching you mechanics and thermodynamics and aerodynamics and all of the stuff, it also teaches you how to understand and approach the world, not only from an engineering standpoint, but from everything. And literally you have a relationship problem. It's a process that you have to kind of go through to think about where you are, to develop a plan, to follow it, to correct, all this stuff, it's, it, it's, it saved my life it, and it fit me perfectly. It's, you know, most of this stuff was luck. How the hell did I know about engineering? I didn't, none, teacher, you know, nurse. Those were the, that was the universe. But I lucked into this space because I'm a very organized person. I love um, frames and frameworks. I live comfortably when things are organized, when there is a process, when I can see that there's a, there's a way out, even if I don't know the way out. Um, so, and engineering, it fell right in. It, the more people who study this, the less things like fake news, <laughs> you know, these things that you just, this intellectual, it teaches you intellectual curiosity. Yeah. You have to, you know, this continued why, why, why. It works this way today, but I assure you it can be smaller, it can be faster, it can be better. It's just, a, it's a great place to, it's a great field to study. So even if you want to be an artist, yeah. I think taking some engineering classes would be unbelievably helpful to most people. Yeah, I love that notion of possibility because it implies also having imagination Absolutely. to see what's not there, right? Absolutely. So, so, so it, it you had you started out as an intern at Xerox, and then you know, <laughs> decades later became CEO. But what was that first internship like? What did you do, and and how did that? Um, launch you on this long-term career at Xerox? Yeah, I, I lucked out a, a couple of places in my life. I, I, I published a book, as you probably know, I'll show it to you later, called Where You Are Is Not Who You Are. And it chronicles these lucky, quote unquote, lucky intersections that I had in life. One was I, I was lucky to have this unbelievable mother who, who against every single odd, every single odd, was joyous and inspirational and saw possibilities. I was lucky to fall, stumble into engineering, literally stumble into it. I had no idea what the hell was going on. I was unbelievably lucky to get, get, to, get to Xerox. Xerox was the perfect company for me. So here is Xerox. It's a company that was always scrambling. It was something always wrong, right? It created this great technology. We had this decree by the government that we had to let all the patents go to all because we were a monopoly. We competition from the Japanese. It was always it always had to reinvent itself. It always was kind of scrambling. And for me, 
what did what did that mean for me? Mm-hmm. It meant opportunity. Right? So <laughs> literally, people there there was a lot of work to be done. There was always something kind of not working, you know. And so I go into the company. I I was hired in the year when we fired almost twenty five thousand people from the company. Yeah, in a year, it's amazing. People were running out. They were smart enough to know that was because we had lost this consent decree. A whole bunch of competition came in from the Japanese. We had to resize and reshape everything. And the technology was starting to be chipped away at in other from other technologies. And so I was hired as you know, we have to always have connections to colleges and young students. I came in, young people. I came in, and literally people were leaving, but work had to be done. So I was given my first project, I was given a lab and I was given a technician. This is a person who is not an engine, not a four-year engineer uh, person, but who knows how to work and design experiments and work in the lab, right? So you don't go in there and kill yourself, right? You pull yourself up. And I was assigned because I had done graduate work on um, the aerodynamics of high-speed rotating discs. This is one of the, that was what I was, what I got interested in and specialized in. And Xerox, had a problem with um, a scanner that they had and they wanted to make the disc out of glass. Anyway, I was given this lab, this technician and the problem. And I literally went three years in a row, three years, me and this guy named Dick Schick walked in and out of the lab trying to solve this problem of how to put a hole in the glass, how to mount the glass so that it doesn't wobble and crack. It's an eighth of an, you know, just amazing. And they basically trusted, they basically (laughs) said, here's your budget, here's the guy, go off and do this. And it was so empowering to not have a huge amount of questions. It was also daunting because I had very little guidance, right? The only guidance was don't kill yourself, right? (laughs) Don't kill yourself and make sure we can use it when it's done. It was perfect. It was a perfect place. So I entered this company with, with implied bona fides that I could actually do something in a lab that I had never really done before. And that, for my whole career, I did that. We figured out the mounting. Everything was great. Um, I met my the man who would be my husband. You know, we were married uh, many years later. But um, and he was the guy who pulled me out of the lab. He saw me walking in and out every day and said, you know, he's my husband was is twenty was twenty years older than I was and had been at Xerox for at that time for about fifteen or eighteen years. So he was way ahead of me at, at Xerox. He was a principal scientist, a research scientist. He's like one of the most exalted kind of guys because he had his, he was a, what we call a fellow, a research fellow. He could do whatever the hell he wanted. And I was walking in and out and he would say to me, you know, you walk in and out of this building every day and you never look up. You should find out what's happening in the company, learn more about the company. And I had learned all I needed to learn, which is that I had a lab, I had a dictionary, and that was it. And my idea was that I was up in upstate New York. I was going to go back downstate because, you know, who wants to live in upstate New York when you could live in New York City, which is where all my friends were. My mother was still there, et cetera. And I, he brought me out of the lab and introduced me to a whole bunch of, like, clubs. They're not clubs, but caucus groups that were in Iraq at the time and just showed me the rest. So I was, I was fortunate to walk into a company that was concerned about what I had here, mm-hmm. not how, my, how I looked. They didn't seem to be that concerned about that. How I spoke, fast, rapid fire, still a lot of colloquialisms because I came from New York City. I was clearly a black woman. I have hair that was even bigger than yours is right now, Dr. Campbell. <laughs> Literally, it was, I was this crazy odd thing that walked around and all they were concerned about was whether or not I was reasonably talented and I could help them with the problem set that they had. Yeah. That's unique. Xerox, and that's one of the reasons why I loved it. And I, even when I was, when I was lured away, attempted to be lured away by great jobs, other places, yeah. I stayed because these guys, they had all the problems of any big company, right? They had racism and sexism, but yeah. their front foot was different. Their front foot was talent their front foot was trying to be a better a better person to people inside the company and it was really really useful to me so i looked out and going to xerox because they gave me the chance to kind of settle in that's that is, that is great if i were if i were converting that to advice for students i, I would say look, look for when you're interning look for a place that that does recognize your talents and where you can show them off 
But I say this a lot. I say this a lot, Dr. Campbell. Sorry for interrupting you. I tell you what, we make so many decisions in life nowadays. This is very, very different in the last 15 years or so, 20. It's all about the money. Yeah. You know, gotta make more money. I have to, it's all about the money, then it's about the power, right? And then it's about the position. And I say it's particularly in the beginning of your career, it's not nothing. It's nothing about the money. That's it's, right. I'm telling you, the amount of difference that you're talking about here, yeah. thousand of dollars, you know, maybe five thousand dollars. Trust me, the wrong place will crush your spirit, right? And you just cannot. It will not allow you to grow. You have to go to a place that is complete. Yeah. It's a complete company. They want your brain, but they also want your heart and your soul. Right. And they want the color of your skin, and they want the texture of your <laughs> ear. They want it all, right? Now, so speaking of your heart and soul, I have a question that has come in and it says, you know, can you speak about how having limited access to quality health care, healthy food, housing impacted your development and your career choices, which is another way also of saying, what did you bring to Xerox? I mean, Xerox was a, clearly a great place for you, but you also brought something from, from that very tough experience. Absolutely. You know, one of the things I think the, the question is so wonderful. I talk about this in the book and I talk about the color, the smell and the feel of poverty. Mm. Right? And, and you, I realized that after I started to play outside of poverty on a continuous basis, that was when I was in graduate school. Mm -hmm. But poverty is kind of like grayish dusty mm -hmm. color mm -hmm. it smell you know the smell i tell you you can walk up you know the smell right you know the structures you know the you can see visually the disorganization the efforts for people to kind of create great spaces in a barren landscape so the feel the look of color all of it not having the thing that was interesting is not having excellent food my mother was a great cook and so she did she it always tasted good always tasted good but we, I didn't know what a Brussels sprout was mm. until I was in, um, in uh, college. Yeah. If you think about this, I hadn't seen asparagus. Mm. These are things that people today can't even imagine because we didn't have like the books or the computers that you have today. Literally, you couldn't just look up asparagus. We literally didn't see it. We right. did, you know, having um, steak, these times the things were not, we were prepared food, sliced meat, welfare cheese, mm -hmm. um, sugar, lard, you know, flour, people. We had to make it, make do can, you know, cans of beans, Vienna sausage. That's how you live. And this thing, we didn't know, I didn't know that there was a world out there where they had literally, this is crazy, like restaurants that were real restaurants that you go into and you order food. If you remember, Dr. Campbell, you may be able to remember the kids that we're talking to now, the women. I'm definitely old enough to remember, yes. They, they, they don't know, but literally there were no visuals about restaurants. We didn't hear, TV had three channels, very, very, very tightly controlled um, access to television I had. And by the way, even if it were controlled, there was not that much. So basically your world is just smaller. Your palate is less developed. Your your um, possibilities are less nurtured. Mm -hmm. So it's a completely different world. And the vast majority of people in this world today live in that environment, not just in America. We have seven and a half billion people close to it on the planet, and over four billion of them live in some substandard living conditions, literally, where they don't have continuous potable water, safety, good food. So it's what it was for me was it was an eye opener when I was in it it was fine I had a great mom she took care of us it was you know food was good it was not plentiful as I got out of it I was like it was literally like oh my god is this what it's like out there is this what the world is like so it's such a you don't need it all you don't need to have all you know I, I you don't need it all but you should not be denied any of it right Right. And that's what, what's happening now. We structurally deny people from even understanding the possibilities out there for that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now you had, you have the good fortune of meeting your future husband who said to you, 
pick your head up, look around and see what else is, is out there. A as you were going through the, your years at, at, at Xerox, what were some of the other things that you learned that you began to build on? I mean, that was great advice for him to give, you know, to someone just starting out. Yeah, my, uh, some of the advice that I give now and some of the advice that I got um, early on, I was, at Xerox, I was fortunate, like I said, to join a place that needed help. And I was fortunate to not say no to anything. I never said no. People said, I want you to go do X, Y, Z. I said, sure, fine. I mean, I mean, literally, I had not been on an airplane more than twice in my life. Mm. And I was, I literally, in the second year, flew to Japan once a month. Literally. I mean, I went from not flying. I flew as far as I, yeah. Literally, I've gone from New York City to Rochester. That's my flight. And then literally for years and years and years, I would fly to Japan, fly to the Middle East, fly to places in Africa, fly to all over Europe. So it gave me this opportunity to just expand. The, the lesson was, I tell you, I never said no. <laughs> I, my, my, my husband gave me this advice. I remember when he, when he, when I first told him he was my husband and even, even then, I said, they want me to go to Japan. You know, I'm not sure about this. He said, listen to me. They are not going to offer you something that they, that they think is useless to do. They want you to go because they need to have the work done, right? It's not like they're not setting you up for failure. They just, they just need the work done. And so if you can do it, I would raise my hand and do it. This is not a bargaining trip like, well, what am I going to get in return? I literally never got there. It was, you want me to do X, Y, Z? I would do X, Y, Z. Later in my career, I started to become very aware of positioning. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But early in my career, I couldn't care less. I right. didn't care. It was if it needs to be done, if it was offered, I would do it. So that's one. This idea of you got to suck it up when you have a chance. You have to absolutely be curious. You have to absolutely take chances and risks. They tell you to go do this or ask you to go do this. You say, sure. You know, my first response was I never did business planning. My husband would say, well, they obviously think you can do it. So why don't you go over there and do it? So that's one. The second thing I, I tell you I learned along the way is help matters. So having sponsors, mentors, I didn't, I, having sponsors, mentors, or just people to talk to is really useful. And I think that the people to talk to is more important than these mentor things that we're all trying to make up, right? Oh, I, I need a mentor. Trust me, if, the, if your mentor is a CEO, the chances are you're not going to get the help you need. <laughs> you need somebody a little bit lower and closer to you to help you navigate some of the specifics. There's a point where the mentor being the CEO is useful, but it's not the first 10 years of your career, I tell you that. Um, so this idea of having help and building a network of people that you like, that like you, that have different experiences inside and outside the company is unbelievably important. It is counterintuitive to me because I am a loner generally. I am very, very comfortable being alone and in many situations prefer it. To, than being in the crowd. So it was something I had to kind of, I had to work on. And my mother had a series of statements that I will run through really quickly and then I'll stop talking. My mother would, the title of my book is my, one of my mother's most um, enduring statements to me. She said it all the time. She said, Max, my name, my name is Ursula Maxine Burns. She called me Max, my whole family called me Max or Maxine. Max, where you are is not who you are. And remember that when you're rich and famous. My mother had no idea what rich and famous meant. And her idea was literally when you're out of this place, <laughs> the words of where you are. So where you are today, literally kind of grimy living uh, inside of our house was spot, spotless, obviously, but you walk in the hallway and then down the street, it's like, what the hell? I mean, <laughs> the CEO of a company couldn't come from this environment. This is not who you are. But also remember when you're sitting wherever the heck you're sitting, President of the United States, she didn't say this, but I'm just making it up, CEO of a company, that's not who you are either. Who you are is here, right? Who, and it, what happens is we get to a place and we take on all the trappings of the place and forget who the hell we are. My mother would never allow, so that was one. The second thing she said to us all the time was the God is gonna judge you. She said, she would say, God doesn't like ugly. That was, <laughs> God doesn't like ugly. And she didn't mean physically ugly. You know exactly what she meant. Right. And the second thing that was aligned to that is you're going to be judged on whether or not you leave behind more than you take away. 
Yes. That's the entire okay. measure. Do you leave behind more than you take away? And then one of her fi final sayings, there are a whole bunch of more of them in the book was, Max, the world doesn't happen to you. You have to happen to the world, which means you can't sit here and wait. There's a great Gil Scott Heron song, the revolution will not be televised. You can't sit back and watch the revolution. <laughs> you gotta participate in order for it to happen. And that's what she said, you can't sit back and have the world happen to you. You have to literally go out there and happen to the world. And so she was great. And I work my, literally, I write about this in the book, my entire approach to how I work, to how I attack a problem, to all of that is with these fundamental things. It's not like, you know, use the best consultants, no. <laughs> it is literally where you are is not who you are. Remember that because the other the people in this room, the people who are the techs in the lab, the cleaning person can probably contribute to a solution here. So absolutely get people engaged. This idea that you're going to sit back and hope like hell things get better. You know, we missed earnings. I'm going to hope it gets better. The world doesn't happen to you. You have to happen to the world. Take. So she was all of my work life is these things that my mother who had four years of high school and a year of college when she was 55 years old. That's all of it comes from that. Wow, deep values, really deep values. So a question has come up. You mentioned a bit just a few minutes earlier that you have two children. You're married, have, you, have married you were married and have two children. And that, um, so the question is, how do you balance? I mean, he, going through this career, I know you must get this all the time. How do you balance your family life with the demands of, going off to Japan or Africa or Europe or where, wherever Xerox may choose to send you? Yeah, this is, I, I get to ask this question a lot. And the reason why I did the, the, um, the gesture and the facial expression is that um, I've come to answer the question in the following way. And that is that we are searching for something that's unachievable, that's unattainable. Even if you didn't work, this thing called balanced, we live as humans in this, we, we kind of ping from end to end to end, we ping all over the place, right? Something important happens uh, and you go run towards it, your family member gets sick, or whatever the hell you wanna have fun, you wanna, so you ping all over the place. And I dispelled in my own head, the measure or the association of success with, with this idea of balance mm -hmm. in the short term. And I've come to believe that on average over time, you'll have balance in your life. But if you're trying to do it in a short spurt, you're going to just fail. You're going, to, you're going to always be behind the curve. In the book, I talk about this a little bit with a friend of mine who was a CEO of the company before I was the CEO. But I took over as CEO from her. And MLK, he would always say that we would have this joke back and forth. How's it going? She had two kids like I did. Her husband was a was 20, 17 years older than she was. Amazing. And she... Um, was an executive at the company higher than her husband, right? And I was an executive higher than my husband. And we would, she would say to me, how's it going? And we would have this grade. I said, it's a D week. Or she would say it's an F week, mean, meaning that that week, work won every single, every single thing, every decision that came up, it was a work. If it was a choice between A, B or C, work won every day, every decision that week. So, and so it's an F week, no balance. We had F weeks, I would say 90% of the time, but it wasn't always F weeks for work. Sometimes when my husband got sick or when I got sick or my kids got, literally it was an F week for work, meaning work, the family got it. So this balance on average over time is what I say, particularly to women that you have to figure out a way to feel comfortable with that because you're not going to be able to get to every game that your kids play. This idea that that's a good parenting um, indicator is bizarre to me. Most of the games are boring. Why the hell would you spend all your time watching this kid do, do things? So I just, you, over time, you have to actually figure out a way to have balance and to, to incorporate all the parts of your life. One is work, right? Yeah. Two is your family. Three, and most important, which I failed on up until I got really sick, is yourself. Yeah. Literally, yeah. I, my doctor told me I literally got so ill, I had... Um, uh, a female problem where I had to have his, hysterectomy was something I had to just put off forever, forever, forever. Just said, you know, I don't have time. I, I can't do this and I don't have time. I remember going to her when I was literally low on iron, feeling terrible. She said to me, Ursula, you are going to be the shortest lived 
senior executive, successful senior executive ever, if you don't pay attention to yourself, mm -hmm. if you don't figure out a way to carve out some time to do the things that you have to do or you like to do. They have nothing to do with your kids, nothing to do with your husband, nothing to do at work. It took me three times. So she did this, I recovered, of course, got crazy again, forgot it you know, and forgot it. But it is, this balance thing is not about short-term balance and measurement. It is about doing what is needed when appropriate and having remediation and support, remediation mechanisms and support to allow you to concentrate and dedicate when you have to in an unbalanced way. And that's how you get balance. It's not about, you know, well, I have to, I have to build a model that looks this way that somebody else built for me, right? That basically white American men built the model for women of what the world should look like, right? We should go to college so we could be smart. We should marry a person so that we can have kids so that when we have kids, we can be good, smart parents to them, but we shouldn't work. You know, so on and so on and so on and so on. And, so on. and black men have their thing. So on and white women have their thing. And black women often are the, you know, we have to knit together our own reality because we, that we absolutely have to work. That's and right. most of us absolutely have to take care of our own kids. And we have to take care of the husband and, and, and. There was no model for us. And we had to kind of figure it out ourselves. And I say, don't fall into the trap of what balance looked like looks like by somebody else's right they have to do it by yourself but anyway that's that's how I did it I just went along and and one thing I married the greatest guy in the world for this <laughs> subject I mean my husband was 20 years older than I am I say this people I, I got really in a lot of trouble for this advice what's the best advice you can give to a, a young woman I say marry somebody 20 years older than you <laughs> because they get old they, they're through all this crap I mean fast cars and all this other stuff they're done with all of that and what he was part? a venture network so that that's right and he this guy knew he knew his way around right he was pretty he was he was not an easy marry don't get me wrong my husband my husband passed away rather unexpectedly in 2019 in january it was a disaster if you want to talk about a disaster just a disaster because you know a, a part of your brain a part of your body is lit literally a part of your body is yes. just gone. And That's in a minute, you have it no more. In a minute, it doesn't exist. Right. And so you, it, there's no adjusting, but you know, we, it takes time. It takes time and we've been able to do it. I've been able to do it with my kids, two great kids, a daughter who's just turned, she's 29 and a son who, my, yeah, she's 29, she'll be 30 this year. My son is 33, just turned 33. My son is a Stanford PhD. My daughter is a pursuing her PhD at Fordham University in English literature. My son is a, is a, is a geophysicist, right? So you've got both spectrum, <laughs> both spectrum happening, yeah. So, so you know, uh, one of the questions that comes up over, and it's come up today, but it comes up over and over and over at every single one of these sessions that we have. And that is how, in the course of your career, you must experience some microaggressions. You know, you're a black woman and very often you're the only one in, in the room, whether it's at Xerox or someplace else, or, you know, in the United States or abroad, we, this, this happens. All the time. All the time. How do you All manage that? You know, part of it is that I, I was kind of numb to it. And let me tell you, this is, a, this is part of the positive thing. This is part of the positive about being where we are right now as black women, women, black women, black people in general. We, I was raised with microaggressions, right? People that didn't like me because I was poor. They didn't like me because I was a woman. They didn't like me because I was black. They had a preconceived notion of my skill set, my worthiness, my, so how do I deal with it? I just live every day like I lived every day. You have a shield around you. There's certain people who can get in. A lot of people can't. Right, the people who can get in. My best friends are literally my girlfriends. Mm -hmm. These people, they, 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 they're not rich, <laughs> they're not famous. You, you get around it because you, you get around it the way that every single one of you watching and listening get around it. You were raised in a place where people do not fundamentally, except for the people really close to you, value you. Right. So they, they just don't. I mean, and even sometimes the men don't die. It's like, you know, they're just like extra. So I don't ever think about it, dealing with the microaggressions, because that's 
my life is dealing with the microaggressions. Remember the first time I went to Japan, it was the most, you can imagine, right? This, it, these people, yeah, and, and, and it, the good news about it is that they were not skilled in hiding their aggressions, right? Or their curiosity or whatever the hell you want to call it. They were like, who the hell are you? They would literally stare. I would go into a meeting, they would, they could not, they would stare with their mouth open and say, what the hell is going on here? How, you know, who are you? What do you do exactly? Why are you here? Et cetera, et cetera. So I, the way that I deal with microaggressions is that I, the question is, how do I deal with niceness? That's, that would be a harder, right? It's so <laughs> odd to me. The way I deal with microaggressions, because it is so natural with the way that I was treated, just naturally. They liked my brain, but there was always this question about what the heck, you know, really? Really? And I, I say this in the book as well. This whole statement that people would say to me, Ursula, you are absolutely phenomenal. You are a phenomenon. You are unbelievably bright. You are amazing. Oh my God. I remember literally when I became president of the company, I had calls from everybody. When I became CEO, it was insane. President. <laughs> and, it, and they would say to me, you're just spectacular. And, I, and early on, I had realized that, that those statements were not statements about me. Right that these were tools that these people were using to allow themselves to feel comfortable with me being in the room. The only way that somebody like me could be in the room is if I were spectacular, yeah. right? Because otherwise they would be, right? They, so in order for me to play with them mm -hmm. in a normal game, I have to, they, they're in their world, they had to make me into this abnormal, Mm. superior being it is racist and it is sexist yeah. so all these words about the you know when sisters call me phenomenal I, I get nervous because I'm a little bit worried because they may actually think it when the white people say it to me and I don't this is not race only right but particularly when white men in business I would I say I, I said it all the time and I say it more articulately in a book I went to college just like you went to college the same goddamn colleges that you did I got <laughs> grades just like you got grades same or better grades than you did, but I didn't like go to college and get out in one year. I didn't leap a tall building. I did exactly what you did. Right. I am as good as you are. I am, the problem that you guys have is that you're not, there are more people that look like me mm -hmm. that have a background like me that you're not letting in. You are right. structurally not letting in. And right now the, oh, what you say is we're keeping them out because they're not as good as Ursula. Look at Ursula, she's spectacular. That's BS, it's right. BS. <laughs> right. So, I, the microaggressions come out in a lot of ways, sometimes yeah, as a compliment, yeah. right? Sometimes it sounds like a compliment. Sometimes it sounds like a compliment, but it's not a compliment. You know, it's just not, I know, I grew up with the people who I grew up with and a lot of them, smarter, harder working, you know, running like as hard as I did, they just didn't have the chances. They didn't have the, they didn't have the, the, the fortune of great people giving this, it's all about giving me an opportunity. And I have a background and a mother who said, you, this, when an opportunity comes, you grab that damn thing. You don't sit here and question it 15 different times. You don't become selfish with it, you share it. I just had a fundamentally good yeah. background and, fun, and, and just good life. Yeah, I was thinking what you're saying about your mother. She was so affirming, right? She said yes to you. She and said yes to me. And she lo she listened. She had high demands and high standards, but yeah. she was always uh, she was always affirming. She was pretty so, cool. Yeah, she was pretty cool. She died here's an her. interesting question. Um, it says, "Can you share how you view material wealth now?" Oh God, great question. It's and great I ask that question because I have to be very honest. Sometimes when I listen to um, people talk, there's a suspicion about wealth and good intentions and uh, you know, almost as if wealth is is in and of itself something evil and to be avoided. What's your view oh, of wealth? I think that um, this is not a bad thing to strive for, and 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 I like it. So, I love the characterization that you just said. I used to have this um, back and forth with uh, a certain president, um, and I and I would say to him and people like him, all the presidents have been him so far, so I can say that safely, because it could be any of them, um, that right now, the way that you are acting towards capitalism and wealth, 
that's born from capitalism, you would say to my, my mother, you would say to my mother, she could not be proud of me, right? Because my mother would be proud of me because I have achieved what I have achieved from a financial standpoint, but also because I'm a good person, fundamentally, at least trying to be a good person. I'm not quite there yet. There's some days where I'm pretty sure I'm not the best person in the world. And I think that wealth born from what I call just capital, just capital and just capitalism, it's fine. I mean, I, this is, there's nothing wrong with it. But I had a sign in my room when I was growing up and it said, poverty sucks. And I, I'm, uh, poverty sucks. And being, being proud of poverty is, is like being proud of wealth. It's not the right thing, right? It, it's the journey that you're on to get better. And if you want to be in that space where you have very little material wealth, that's fine. Just as long as you do it in a space that, in a way that's good. Um, it's, but, but I, I, that's a whole bunch of rationalization you just heard because in the gut sometimes, one of the, more often than sometimes, one of the most difficult things I have to deal with is how much money I have mm. and how much privilege I have because I have money, mm -hmm. how much privilege and power I have because I have position, right? And the way that I deal with that, my, my band-aid for that wound is to help others. Mm. Right? The band-aid is to just, and enjoy myself, right? It, take, it took me a long time to enjoy myself. One of the reasons why, why I'm probably as financially settled as I am now is because I've never lived, I ne it took a long time for me to live as though I had more than, <laughs> you know, more than literally a little bit of money. I literally cannot get comfortable I'm just starting to get comfortable with the fact that I don't have to look at money ever. I can just do whatever I want, right? right? That's a very difficult position to be in because so many people that I know that are close to me yeah. can't do that. And the way that we, we manage that is literally my husband and I, my husband now, like I said, passed away. He was the one who, who was really good at this. Just give, it, just give it to them. You know, the kids need a house. You don't give them, you just buy them a house. Grand, granddaughter needs a house, get her a house. This idea, it's not just give them a house. It's not like we just throw the money, but literally enabling people to enjoy as well and to have a better start. This is a big deal for me, this idea of a better start. When I was able to buy my first house when I was 24 years old, because I happened to go, I was in Rochester, New York. A house was $40,000. I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, I could have, you know, I, I was only making $29,006 when I started, but, you know, I could get a mortgage and a 30 year mortgage, which is amazing. My son and daughter, my nieces, it, they could, they, they picked bad places to live Palo Alto, California, New York City. They couldn't get close. They had 10 times more education, more opportunity, more everything, and they couldn't get close to buying a goddamn house because yeah. it's so expensive. Yeah. So, the reason why I say all of that, that the way that I get comfortable with the with this fundamental guilt, like the Catholic girl guilt of having more than others, is to try to share the wealth. Yeah. And to try to do it not only financially, but to do it in advice, in just helping, just helping as much as you, as much as you can. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna show my book on the on the screen. Yeah. Ah, oh, love the book. Where you are is not who you are. Everybody make sure. go out and buy it. <laughs> yeah, you got to buy it. Buy it on Amazon. It's been out for a while. It's, it's doing well. Buy it. And I read it myself. So buy the audio if you want to hear me talk. <laughs> I hated it. But... So we have two minutes left and I've got a lightning round for you. Okay, great. okay, so rapid fire questions. What motivates you to get out of bed in the morning? My kids. What book or books are you reading now? Uh, I just am. Uh, what did I? I just finished. Just finished. Um, the warmth of uh, the warmth of other suns for the second time. Oh, um, great, I, did, great I read it the first time and then I listened to it and then I had to read it again. Um, I love the book. Great. And then I, I right before that I read and I just finished reading uh, Jack, um, Marilyn, Marianne, Marilyn, Marilyn Robinson's book. She did oh, Gilead, okay. Lila, and just got to read oh, the latest yeah, on yeah, Jack. Yeah. yeah, you gotta read that whole series is phenomenal. Oh, okay. I read I read uh, I'm a, a avid voracious reader I yeah. read, I yeah. read a lot. and it's all fiction it's not you know it's not romance novels but it's it's junk <laughs> it's not business books yeah. right yeah love it all right 
Is your bed made up right now? Yes. <laughs> but this is something new for me. Interesting. My sister taught me this. I grew up and I never made my bed, never. And um, I, you know, in my house, this great houses, I never made my bed. And then my life was getting more and more complicated. Just, you know, I stopped working, which is a structure and I had boards and started two companies and I make my bed most, just about every morning now because it it's a, starts being an organized plane. You know, it's just an interesting, interesting thing. My sister's the one who, she, when she stays with me, she always makes the bed, almost like it's brand new. And it, when you walk into the room, it's like, oh, comforting. So I make my bed now. Yeah. Order. <laughs> order, order. I have a long list of more questions, but I'm looking and believe it or not, we are out of time. I no, you have to invite me to Spelman again and I'll come up and uh, do it live with you guys. Well, we'd love for you to come to Spelman. And I know that you would have any, you know, a, a big audience. We've had a great time uh, listening to you list and learning from you. Ursula Burns, you are a living legend. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And to everyone who's out there listening in, be well, be safe, and keep the faith.